Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this Chatham House uh, event entitled The Extractive Industries, Transparency Initiative, Corruption and Eurasia. Uh, many of the former Soviet republics of Eurasia rely on natural resources for the majority of their GDP. Yet it's these same countries that struggle with high levels of, of corruption that can prevent revenues from going where they are most needed. Now, EITI was founded in, 2000 and, uh, in 2003, almost 20 years on now, the aim of bringing transparency to the payments made by extractive companies to governments and improving governance and economic outcomes. Uh, its success relies on effective multi-stakeholder engagement, and that was what was revolutionary about EITI in that it brought together in an initiative for the first time extractive companies, government, and uh, civil society at the, at the country level. So this uh, event explores to the extent at which EITI's activities have helped increase transparency, the, uh, the successes, the, uh, the, the failures, and we have a great panel to discuss the issues. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. We are on the record today and we are being uh, recorded. Uh, if I could also ask the speakers to keep an eye on their allotted time of five to seven minutes, I'll be timing it. And I will give you the finger, uh, the, the, the cricket umpire finger to indicate you have one minute left. So, so keep an eye on me on your screen. Um, obviously it's uh, an interactive event. So if you have questions, please send them in via the Q&A function and we will uh, try our best to, to deal with them all. Uh, and now uh, let's have our first uh, presentation from uh, Oliana Valigora. She is a regional director at the EITI International Secretariat and supports the Eastern Europe uh, Caucasus and Central Asia team. She has more than 10 years of experience in good governance and transparency in the extractive industries. As the regional director, Oliana focuses on coordinating, supporting and supporting implementation processes in portfolio countries, leading regional coordination, networking and capacity building. Prior to joining the ITI in 2015, worked, Oliana worked for Publish What You Pay, Global Civil Society Network, as a regional coordinator for the Eurasia region. She has extensive experience as a civil society activist, advocating for better management of the energy sector and greater reforms in her home country, Ukraine. And many thanks to Aliana for joining us at uh, quite late notice. So really appreciate you giving your time at these uh, uh, difficult uh, weeks. Um, Aliana, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Tom. And uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. It's a pleasure joining you here. I will start by uh, sharing my screen. Well, according to the World Bank, there's 3.5 billion people that are living in countries rich in oil, gas, and minerals. And with good governance, revenues from the extractive industries can have a significant impact on reducing poverty and boosting shared prosperity. Um, EITI uh, works um, with the EITI standard that has a number of requirements that countries that sign up to implement it are required to follow. And EATI has, of course, evolved a lot uh, since its uh, uh, launch um, and the first EATI principles in 2003 to the current 2019 EATI standard. And it's a very live and evolving uh, creature that uh, we try to um, that we try to um, uh, adjust and uh, develop according to the uh, demand from the countries. So right now we'll be also undergoing a process to refine the standard, make changes, make it look uh, uh, more up-to-date and use the experience from, from the implementing countries. Um, the standard covers a number of, of requirements, including uh, the whole value chain, including contracts, alliances, production, revenue collection, allocation, social and economic spending. And uh, in particular, contracts and licenses are crucial uh, in anti-corruption efforts of the governments. Um, the value of extractive data uh, we see through promoting public debate, informing legal and fiscal reforms, clarifying investment environment, minimizing corruption risks, strengthening tax collection, and monitoring revenue um, um, with communities. And how EATI achieves its, um, achieves its uh, impact, it is very important that uh, 
each country that implements ATI has a dedicated multi-stakeholder group. So ATI always invites to the dialogue civil society, government and companies that have equal voices and can decide on their implementation process, contributes to publishing, analyzing, communicating ATI data, as well as uh, inform public debate that would lead to meaningful reforms in their countries. And very important uh, here is that um, the countries where ATI is implemented is uh, has enough freedoms for civil society to fulfill its role um, and um, inform the public about the management of the nature resource uh, natural resources in the country. Therefore, we have a civil society protocol um, that uh, enables uh, civil society to participate in EATI, and we look rigorously into country cases to enable that civil society can fulfill its role. Otherwise, there would be no, no meaning for the EATI um, if the information cannot lead to public discussions. Um, the ATI data can foster public debate, can inform legal and fiscal reforms, can also um, uh, lead to um, identifying corruption risks. And I would like perhaps to focus a bit more on, um, on those elements of the ATI that, um, that lead to um, uh, to eliminating corruption risks. In particular, uh, ATI in, uh, encourages systematic disclosures uh, across its implementing countries, uh, currently 56. Um, we've been sampling um, 30 implementing countries with regards to the amount of information that is uh, accessible online. And you can see it's on the slide, um, uh, it varies, but um, a lot of the countries have um, uh, half of their information available online, wh whereas the rest is being disclosed through ATI reports. And uh, the main goal of ATI is so that the information is available to all citizens uh, through government and company websites and is understandable for, uh, for users and for citizens. And that would lead to public debates that would lead to meaningful reforms and improvement of the governance of nature resources in a particular country. Uh, knowing the terms of contract agreements is very important as well. It's one of the um, crucial elements for anti-corruption. Um, and we have already more than 900 contracts disclosed through EITI disclosures. Uh, 28 countries publish uh, all or some uh, petroleum contracts and 25 countries publish all or some mining contracts. As well as understanding who profits, beneficial ownership is perhaps one of the main um, anti-corruption elements uh, in extractive industries. So it is very important to reveal who owns and controls extractive companies. It's not only important for citizens, but also for the governments and for the um, and for companies and investors to know who they work with. Um, and uh, as well as an, uh, environmental reporting, uh, now we have 28 ATI implementing country, uh, countries who, uh, pro, who publish their environmental data. Um, and uh, some of the countries uh, choose even to include renewable energy into their reporting, like Germany and Albania. Um, and I think it would be, uh, uh, that's a good encouragement for other ATI implementing countries to cover uh, environmental data. Um, and with regards to particular disclosures in the region, I would like to um, tell a bit more about Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyz Republic in Tajikistan. Um, with regards to Kazakhstan, um, uh, a lot of the information, particular company data, uh, what companies pay to the government, um, is published through the um, unified government reporting system. Uh, it's called in, um, in Russian, YGSU, uh, where we can go and see the payments from particular company or total payments, as well as uh, their quasi-fiscal expenditures, uh, social expenditures, um, and also uh, state-owned enterprises operations. 
In Kyrgyz Republic, uh, one of the in innovations that we see is the uh, open budget portal that discloses data and transactions of the central treasury live. And you can see company uh, companies, um, date of transaction and revenue stream, which is very important for uh, mainstream transparency of ATI. And you can see the link to that um, website. Um, and also Tajikistan uh, last year, in December last year, they launched the beneficial ownership portal that discloses information of, uh, um, of beneficial owners of 43 active licenses. Unfortunately, the information is uh, a bit limited with regards to uh, the detail it provides. However, it's a very good um, uh, start for the, uh, for the country to work on beneficial ownership transparency. And perhaps um, just also to, uh, to give a bit of an overview of, of the region, um, uh, of the situation is in countries with regards to Kazakhstan and the Kyrgyz Republic. These are two countries that joined the ATI back in 2007 and have been implementing uh, the standard for, for many years. And we have seen uh, over these years, we have seen a lot of ups and downs. Uh, we still think that um, the ATI is very relevant for both Tajikistan and Kyrgyz Republic with uh, different focuses with regards to Kazakhstan. It will be crucial to um, reach full um, systematic disclosure of data based on the ATI standard so that the process of, licenses is, uh, of licensing um, is understandable for investors, for citizens, and for the uh, governmental agencies. Um, they continue their work on beneficial ownership transparency with uh, more disclosures from the mining companies than from oil and gas, but that's work in progress, as well as they are looking into contract transparency. Uh, I think uh, Maria Lobachova would, uh, would be able to tell more about that. Uh, with regards to the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, one of their key focuses uh, with the ATM implementation is uh, beneficial ownership transparency and the government plans on um, creating um, a register of beneficial ownership for uh, extractive industries. Um, and also uh, the legislation includes um, the legislation includes contract transparency. Um, I think I might pause here, Tom. Uh, I don't know if I'm no, that's out great. Of time. No, that's that's fantastic. Um, I have a few questions, but I think let's move on because we do have not only three uh, official panelists, we also have two uh, discussants. I've managed to shoehorn five panelists technically into the into this uh, event. Um, so let's 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 go go forward with um, Dr. Saipera. Furstenberg, thanks on Oliana for the presentation. Um, Dr. Furstenberg is a postdoc research fellow at the University of Portsmouth, honorary research fellow at the University of Exeter. She completed her PhD in political science from the University of Bremen. Her PhD thesis explored Central Asia in the context of globalization and global governance. After completing her PhD, she worked as a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Exeter on Central uh, Asian uh, political exiles project. And her research interests are in global governance authoritarianism security studies. Uh, luckily for us and this panel, she has studied the EITI in the Kyrgyz Republic and has published a paper on it uh, entitled Critical Reflections on the EITI in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Saipera, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Tom and Chatham House for inviting me for this event. Um, so uh, EITI is part of one stream of my research who examines actually political economic development in countries of Central Asia. And lately I've been largely focusing on Kyrgyzstan, although I also did a study on EITI in Kazakhstan uh, during my PhD. Um, as uh, Aliona has mentioned, um, there are currently over 50 countries um, who have uh, implemented the initiative. And what's interesting um, and also curious is that a large majority of these countries are characterized as being corrupt and also authoritarian. Um, and as several studies uh, point out, although it's AITI um, can be actually a very uh, important tool uh, to mitigate corruption in the extractive sector, it's actually very not clear uh, what the ITI really brings to the sector and how it can actually successfully transform the natural resources management um, in countries uh, that are prone to resource curse. And um, 
Our study that uh, we have uh, conducted uh, lately and that has been published in the World Development Journal with my colleague Janino Dariva um, and uh, on Kyrgyzstan, uh, so the study uh, was um, conducted between periods of 2014 and 2019 um, at uh, different periods of time, um, shows actually that uh, the effect of the EITI in mitigating uh, corruption and improving actually transparency in natural resources um, remains limited and is largely um, being um, adopted as a, as a technocratic exercise um, and largely in Kyrgyzstan to, to please actually the international donor community, but also to increase the reputational concerns. Um, and what we find is that in our studies, actually, there is a big gap uh, between the way that the initiative is implemented at the national level and the way that's actually transcend uh, to subnational local level um, at the community levels. Um, what uh, is striking is that although one of the main objectives and goals of the EITI is actually to uh, promote sustainable development um, and also de um, decrease corruption, uh, but more importantly to empower the local population, um, what our study actually demonstrates that the population is largely uh, excluded from the EITI processes um, and uh, particularly in the decision making process. So more concretely, uh, what it means is that at the subnational level, uh, the um, local grievances around mining sector um, in Kyrgyzstan are uh, articulated um, around the, um, the impact of mining on uh, local livelihoods, um, the impact of mining on environment and uh, resource distribution. Um, and um, uh, the large majority of the population in rural areas are actually unaware of the EITI uh, as an initiative and uh, they are actually lack of information on how revenues um, are from mining industries are actually distributed uh, at the, and how they actually uh, benefited from it. Um, additionally, uh, what our, our study shows is that um, due to the lack of social uh, responsibility practices by mining companies and also lack of government engagement in the mining sector, uh, the relationship between local population and these two actors are strained. Uh, the villages actually, they don't feel confident that mining can actually contribute uh, to any economic development or any or bring any positivity actually uh, in their community. Um, and um, they, the, uh, the more, more importantly, actually, the, gov the, 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 the local communities, they don't trust the government in um, ensuring safe uh, mining uh, regulation in management of resources. Um, finally, when it comes to uh, civil society, uh, what we can see is that, that uh, there is actually fatigue among the local populations uh, uh, about civil society activities. Um, they're actually well aware that civil societies are very often driven by donor objective, and so their actions are limited and they haven't actually seen any uh, tangible effect of what actually civil society brings to mitigating uh, mining conflicts in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and here, uh, what we can see is that uh, in the context of Kyrgyzstan, when it comes to mitigating mining conflicts um, and respond to communities needs, the legitimacy of the civil society here has been compromised. Um, additionally, um, at the national level, what we observe, what we observe is that uh, the fol uh, following the negative assessment of 2017 um, of the EITR on Kyrgyzstan, where the Kyrgyz Republic has been suspended from the initiative, um, the country has actually undertook several reforms and they've been very welcome. Um, the, the parliament uh, of the Kyrgyz Republic has adopted new amendments to the law on subsol, which is uh, the main uh, legislative act that actually uh, manages natural resources uh, in the country. And um, the, the law now uh, requires actually extractive uh, companies um, di to disclose their beneficial ownership. This is also what Iona has men uh, mentioned uh, and, and um, make the licensing agreements more transparent over the natural resources exploitation. And uh, additionally, in 2018, um, the government has also adopted the open uh, budget initiative. Um, while uh, these reforms are welcome and they are important, um, what actually um, happens in reality actually is that these reforms have been very weakly uh, implemented. Um, this is largely due to the fact that the government actually lacks uh, capacity um, to oversee the implementation of these reforms um, uh, in the country. 
Um, so for example, uh, when it comes to uh, beneficial ownership, um, although it's actually a very, um, a very important uh, reform, um, what we can actually see is that um, there is actually a lack of clarity and information uh, over the details about uh, what actually needs to be included and what the State Committee of Industry, Energy and Subsoil Use, which regulates this, needs to collect. Um, the, the other problem relates to the reliability of the data and verification of the data. Um, because uh, the, the agency actually lacks uh, resources to verify this uh, data. Um, and, uh, um, and I can elaborate further on licensing uh, issues and on the open uh, budget portal. But here again, as Elena mentioned, although open budget portal is an important initiative, uh, what we can see at the local levels is that you need to have a, a certain level of literacy and knowledge to actually read these uh, financial reportings. Otherwise, they don't have any use for the local population. And so in conclusion, as I only have one minute left, as, as Tom just mentioned, uh, what's important to know is that uh, there is actually a big uh, discrepancy uh, between um, how the initiative is perceived at the global level and what actually and how it is actually implemented at the local levels uh, within the implementing countries. Uh, and more importantly, I think uh, when we think about the initiative, uh, we need to think about how uh, state institutions, uh, state accountability and state cap capacity can actually do in implementing this initiative and whether they're capable of doing this. So I'll stop here. Thanks, Lyper. Uh, fantastic. Um, I, I guess I do have a question. We perhaps don't need to answer it, it now, but it, you know, it, it would be something along the lines of, you know, it's often said that EITI works best in 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 more open societies, in 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 the less autocratic countries. Um, but that that's probably self-evident, right? Um, and how how would we ever try and counteract that fact? Um, because obviously, and I'm sure we're going to hear about it through uh, when when Gubad speaks. If you have a a corrupt country, they're going to be less likely to implement the kind of things that are needed, such as beneficial ownership uh, uh, transparency. Um, not sure if you want to say anything now or we can we can defer till, till, till later. Um, because of time constraint, I think I will uh, answer this question later um, after all the presentation, but I have noted this and I'll answer this question. Thank you. Sure, fantastic. Thanks, Ipera. Okay, next uh, we have uh, Maria Lobotroha. Uh, she is a program director at Public uh, Association ECHO in Kazakhstan. Her work includes managing a research and advocacy strategy to promote transparency and, and citizen participation. Maria has been working on the implementation of the EITI in Kazakhstan for 15 years and has represented civil society in the EITA, EITI multi-stakeholder group in Kazakhstan for three terms. She's also a moderator of the dialogue platform on the EITI, which brings together NGO coalitions advocating for transparency and accountability in the extractive industry in Kazakhstan. Maria has carried out several analytical works related to the extractive sector's influence on the local population, as well as civic participation in income, man in income management at the subnational level. Uh, Maria, please, the floor is yours. Uh, tell us about the, the picture in Kazakhstan. Thank you, Tom and Chatham House for inviting me. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Kazakhstan is an EITI implementing country for 15 years, and uh, our country definitely have achievements. So, for example, our legislation requires every extractive company to, pro to provide EITI reports, disaggregated by payment flows, to provide information about beneficial owners. We have an online portal that Alana mentioned where everyone can see up-to-date data even before the publication of the national EITI report. The disclosure of data on local social infrastructure paid by companies can be considered as a serious achievement because this information attracts the attention of local communities, journalists, and uh, in fact, initiates discussions. At the same time, many serious challenges remain, which are more about what transparency should lead to. Kazakhstan is still a country with a economy dependent on natural resources. Moreover, recent events have clearly demonstrated the dependence of state revenues on the oil transportation through Russia. 80% of Kazakhstan oil is exported uh, through the Caspian pipeline. And due the recent pipeline breakdown accident, we have already lost about 
160 million of US uh, dollars and keep on losing. There are problems with fair taxation, license allocation, payment flows of national owned companies, beneficial ownership in oil and gas sector, and data verification on beneficial ownership. Contract disclosure, for example, contracts of the most important oil fields, Kashagan, Karachigan, Actin, Giz, are completely confidential. And uh, unfortunately, local societies are excluded from decision making process. Unfortunately, transparency itself does not lead to accountability and better governance. The lack of political view and as a result, the absence of real tools of accountability is perhaps the most serious problem. For example, after the Paradise Paper leak, the name of Sawat Manbaev surfaced. He is a politically exposed person who held position, positions related to the extractive sector. And for the Kazakhstan authorities, his statement that most of the information is not true was enough not to start an investigation. And to the question, does the ATI help to, uh, in, to fight against corruption? I think that many Kazakhstanis would answer no. Since in Kazakhstan, the fight against corruption was more of a tool for settling personal scores and clear, clearing the political field for creating a, a loyal environment. In many ways, the fight against corruption is hindered by the strong state control of civic space and freedom of speech through a number of provisions of the criminal code. For example, an article on inciting hatred, when criticism of officials can be recognized as such hatred, or assumption of corruption may be considered by government as spreading misinformation. It's quite hard to talk about corruption when everything belongs to the president's family and you can be accused of insulting the president. And now we have some independent investigation from journalists about property and funds of the first president, but don't see the real reaction of authorities for these investigations. Without directly violating the protocol of civil society participation, the government created an atmosphere of a strong self-censorship. Uh, and the last thing that does not seem to be a such serious uh, obstacle, but, but in reality hinders the ATI implementation, it is the ignoring the demands of society by, by government bodies. Although many activists in Kazakhstan are trying to draw at attention to problems with the governance in the extractive sector, the government has not taken any real action. There are no real instruments of influence on the authorities in the country. There is neither an effective parliament nor a fair judiciary. And even such an ATI tool as validation does not have the wanted impact. The next validation will start in January next year and the last meeting of MSG took place almost a year ago. In MSG, there is no representatives of anti-corruption agency. And it seems that the government considers it sufficient to achieve meaningful progress or moderate score, uh, which makes it possible to, so to sound significant, at the same time ignore various problems to of failure to meet certain requirements. And to summarize briefly, a lot of, in Kazakhstan, a lot of data is disclosed, but its disclosure did not lead to significant changes in the governance of the extractive sector due to the lack of effective tools of government accountability to society. Maybe the situation will change uh, since the first president was remo removed from decision making. We'll see. Thank you. Maria, fantastic. That was absolutely brilliant uh, overview of, of not just the ATI issues, but other issues in Kazakhstan. Maybe a very brief follow-up question, just specifically on EITI. Since President Tokayev came to power in 2019, have you seen more enthusiasm for EITI process, less, or uh, from what you were saying, it seems about the, about the same? What, what would you say? I think uh, we have the less enthusiasm because uh, in 2019, we have the restructuring of the ministry that is responsible for ATI implementation. And now we don't, I think the staff in the ministry is not, uh, uh, has no, not enough of sources to implement the ATI. In, in fact, I don't see any movements forward mm. now. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Maria.
Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Gubad Ibadoglu, an economist originally from Azerbaijan, currently a senior visiting fellow in the Department of International Relations at LSE. His research focuses on public management finance and policy. He was a member of the EITI MSG from uh, 2010 to 2012 and was a civil society representative to the EITI board as a full member in 2013 and to 2015. Uh, he was also a member of the strategy advisory group, Publish What You Pay. And be before coming a senior visiting fellow at LSE, he was a, an affiliated postdoc fellow in the Rutgers Center for European Studies. Now, Gubad, Azerbaijan is a very interesting case when it comes to EITI. They were one of the first countries to, to, to sign up to, to EITI. I was actually at the launch of, of, of EITI in the Azerbaijani embassy in London back in 2004, I think it was. They were the first country to be validated. And yet in 2017, they removed themselves from the EITI process. Um, they were probably about to be kicked out for failing to uh, implement reforms of, of, of civil society failing to ease restrictions on uh, uh, civil society. Um, Gubad, please tell us about the situation in, in Azerbaijan and, and, and why, why it failed. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this uh, discussion. And good morning, good afternoon, wherever uh, you are uh, in the world. And when Ukraine's Maidan protests unfolded in 2014. The authorities in Azerbaijan tightened the operating environment for civil society organization. As at that time, they launched a harsh crackdown on the civil society in Azerbaijan. The crackdown on the independent civil society has had profoundly negative effect on the ability of the NGOs and the civil activists to engage and promote to the implementation of the EIT in Azerbaijan. In the case of the many independent civil society organizations, their bank account and even the personal account, mine as well, uh, were uh, seized by the court decision adopted without any opportunity for the NGOs leaders to defend themselves. Dozens of the members of the Dependent civil society organizations group were interrogated by the prosecutor's office and the criminal case were opened against several uh, civil society organizations. Under this pressure, many independent civil society organizations working on EITI uh, and the environment and uh, other issues, the human rights issues were compelled to suspend their activities. Therefore, active discussion about the Azerbaijan civil society organization participation in the EITI first started uh, international board meeting in 1st and the 2nd July in 2014. Then international civil society representative on the EITI board uh, stated that the country no longer abides by one of the EITI fundamental principles, ensuring free and effective participation of the civil society in the process. And in addition, local civil society face severe restriction on their right to exercise environmental freedom of the speech and assembly. The Azerbaijan government makes it almost impossible for local civil society to access foreign funding or fulfill the it is a essential function concerning the EITI. As the result of the board decide to send the funding mission into Azerbaijan. And on the base of the fund funding mission, uh, the report, uh, the ITI made a decision about the first time decision about the downgraded status of uh, Azerbaijan from the compliant uh, to, uh, to the candidacy. And uh, this is an, an this was an uh, unpre unprecedented move. Not only has no country even been demoted, before, it's also first an implementing government to fail validation for not having met the requirement relating to very and effective civil society participation. And as you know, the ITI board uh, in 2017, as uh, the Tom mentioned, suspended Azerbaijan membership and the Oliana and Simon witnessed all this discussion. And the government of Azerbaijan decided to withdraw from, Azo from the EITI uh, on the March uh, 2017, and then the government uh, established local and the bilateral uh, transparency initiative uh, with the participation of the extract industry companies. And the government commission 
uh, leave the door open for the civil society organization, but only as observers after the withdrawal from the ITI. This commission produced two times the ITI report and stopped it is activity after two years uh, and transferred this book now to the state statistical committee as a routine process. The other government, uh, the other government afraid uh, all, all time, it, it shared a very, very uh, big concern about the beneficial ownership and the transparency of the spending of oil revenues. The government uh, during uh, EITI time was against it. The government explained that this our own decision where how many, how much we are going to spend oil money. And at the same time, they never, uh, they never supported the beneficial ownership. And uh, I think this is also one of the reasons why I failed the ITI in Azerbaijan. Uh, because uh, the spending on oil revenue was poor and based on the overestimation on mega project, and mainly in the construction sector. This sector was traditionally corrupt. And the second, many proxy foreign companies belong to the ruling family and the political elites involved EITI uh, as a part of the production sharing agreement. The government does not want to disclose real stakeholders in extractive industries. According to the OCCR, in gold mining contract, Ilham Aliyev, the president of Azerbaijan, signed production sharing agreement on behalf of the state and his daughters on behalf of this, uh, on behalf of the company. And EITI, uh, especially the MSG, was an excellent platform for us. Uh, via this platform, we cooperated with the government and the extra industry companies and raised the our question and impact on decision making process in oil and the gas management uh, revenues. We lost this platform after the withdrawal of Azerbaijan from the EITI. We lost platform for debate as well as lost platform uh, to the access of the data on extract industry. Uh, and in that time, we tried to expose some corruption risk when the cancellation of the data. Uh, but unfortunately, now we can't access this uh, information. And before Azerbaijan was uh, in EITI, uh, uh, we united. And, uh, during the EITI process, as a civil society, we united and we started discussion. Uh, but then when Azerbaijan left uh, EITI, uh, Azerbaijan civil society coalition, unfortunately, split into two groups. And uh, in that time, we relied uh, the EBRD and other uh, international financial institutions can support the civil society organization. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the EBRD would uh, EBRD support the uh, government of Azerbaijan decision. And uh, they, they prefer the more commercial interest uh, than uh, protecting the public interest of the civil society organization. That's why uh, EITI failed in, in Azerbaijan. That's all I want to share at this moment. Thanks so much for your attention. Thanks, Gubert. Um You mentioned how the, uh, you know, the, 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 the MSG uh, kind of brought together civil society and that was one positive. Um, what about the data itself that was published uh, through EITI reports? What's your feeling? Was this was this was this beneficial? Uh, was it useful uh, as a member of civil society? Or what's 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 your thoughts? Was it you know did it did it achieve what it was setting out to do, bringing transparency to the to the to the to the, the Azeri oil industry? Um, in that time, really, we had very strong the civil society organization or of the uh, members of the MHC on behalf of the civil society organization were uh, elected. And uh, uh, there was uh, mostly uh, the economist and who is, uh, has experience to work with the data. That's why the government, uh, government and the company uh, when we came there together, uh, they take into account uh, the question uh, the civil society raised. And uh, it was a really good uh, platform for the debate. And at the same time, we involved the 
reconciliation process, we bought the, uh, the reporting process, and really we use this data. We use this data and we try to uh, expose some corruption risk when the reconciliation there to different uh, uh, data from companies, from the government. Sometimes we disclose some risk and uh, corruption risk, uh, not all time, because before it was difficult when uh, the company and government disclose this data aggregate. And then, then as you know, the EITI changed the standard uh, and the, all of the members uh, disclose the disaggregated uh, data. And when they disclose the disaggregated data, uh, it was very reliable and it was uh, very comprehensive. And we use, uh, we use this uh, data, we publish uh, a lot of uh, analytic uh, paper and we publish our report on behalf of the civil society coalition. We publish our conclusion uh, every time we publish uh, our uh, the feedback uh, about the EITI report. But now uh, the EITI in the coalition uh, exists, uh, but uh, the environmental station, the operational station uh, for the civil society is not acceptable. That's why uh, we, we are lost uh, our access to this data as well as uh, we lost the access to the foreign funding, uh, the project. And now, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are not produce any feedback, any conclusion on behalf of the civil society coalition. Great, thanks, thanks Gubert, for that. For that. Um, okay, moving on to our last speaker, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Uh, Simon Taylor, co-founder of Global, Global Witness, uh, an NGO focused on anti-corruption and climate change issues. Exposing corruption led to Global Witness's conception of the Publish What You Pay campaign which Simon co-launched in 2002 with George Soros and other NGOs, including Transparency International and Save the Children. Simon is an expert on climate change with a particular interest in the way in which the fossil fuel industry has co-opted global politics to prevent appropriate action to address the climate crisis. Uh, Simon's not really a regional specialist in terms of Eurasia, but brings with him a, a, a wealth of, of knowledge and experience in relation to transparency issues. Simon, the, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh... I, I suppose one of my frustrations with debates around these issues is the <clears throat> what feels sometimes like an overfocus on the word transparency. Uh, for, for me, transparency was always like one of a panoply of tools. And if you go back to the to that early stage, we didn't have it. Everything was a big opaque mess. But what was clear in multiple countries was, particularly the fossil fuel industry, but wider than the fossil fuel industry, was that companies uh, were variously, depending on the country, involved in uh, everything from bankrolling corrupt leaders uh, and the theft of state assets in, in their favor, uh, all the way through to bankrolling conflict, and in some cases, literally directly complicit in shipping arms and various other things. Um, so the work that we began started in Angola, but we quickly realized that the, this, this whole problem and countries on various sort of parts of that spectrum around the world had similar features. Uh, and um, one of the other problems at the time was uh, we had gone through an experience of trying to take money out of a conflict. So the focus, as I said, was on Angola, which was still suffering from a civil war at the time. And um, we, we appreciated that there was no way that we could win a campaign anytime soon in a meaningful time frame to reduce violence by seeking to get the money flows out of Angola. And so therefore, pretty much the only thing left was to pursue accountability around the money flows to try and find a way of enabling citizens to follow the money. So that was the origin of the ask really was to call for disclosure of the revenue streams such that people could follow the money and ask the questions. That was rejected and what we were offered politically was EITI and uh, I've taken us back to that start point because the whole point of EITI in its launch, that which was promised as a political response, was that we were going to build an accountability mechanism. Transparency was just one of the components, and it was always envisaged that other bits would come in, things like beneficial ownership, 
um, contracts and so on and so forth. But we had to work on it bit by bit. And gradually, as you can see, that the standard has sort of developed out of nothing, an aspirational ask, to the standard that it is today. But I think that's quite important to differentiate between what we mean by accountability and transparency centered around a set of criteria. Because if we overly focus on transparency, we end up in a world where we sort of think transparency is the aim. And we, we, we create a mechanism that's highly technocratic and actually doesn't remotely address the problem that we're talking about, namely broad terms is accountability of the extractive sector. And for me, accountability of the extractive sector includes dis around decisions whether or not to go forward and do an extraction project or not. And the central role that citizens should be empowered to play under principles like free prior and informed consent about whether or not a project goes ahead and on what terms and what basis. And in the end, the whole thing is centered around that resources essentially belong to the people of a country. Therefore, the real contractual partner in any such relationship are the citizens. The government is the temporary custodian in all cases, even if you're a dictator for life, you're going to die in the end. So, you know, the, the, the government is always a, a temporary custodian of the sovereignty. And so this whole issue around, well, these are confidential is, is frankly appalling because the real contractual partner are the citizens and they should have an absolute right to understand the basis of a deal going forward, why it went forward, the conditions, the terms and so on and so forth. Anyway, wind the clock forward. We have a standard that is not bad. It is incomplete, but it is variously interpreted in a, in my view, not not well, particularly around things to do with guaranteeing the ability of citizens to participate and actually play that accountability role. Of course, we've heard of conditions in country that mitigate that. And that's why I think we also have to see EITI and uh, efforts like this in the context that it's not the only thing that's important. We have to have other things like government institutions able to pursue corrupt people and prosecute them and so forth. So it, it's a part of a panoply of, of, of efforts. And in places where the political will to actually address the accountability space, I think we can see some really good progress. In other places, in more autocratic places, where if you put your head up as a citizen and ask questions, you might get murdered, it's really not doing a great job at all. I, we can come back to that, but I just wanted to sort of move on from that a little bit and just um, link the corruption uh, issue and dealing with the governance issue to success or potential success or failure around dealing with the climate crisis. Uh, and I think that's absolutely critical because in many places, the main reason why projects appear to be going ahead is not because, although they're claimed to be, because they predict bring a development potential to the country, but because some individuals in autocratic governments think they can continue to rake profits off the top. In other words, the dependency is less about the need for income streams, although it could, you know, a project if well managed could generate money for citizens and development, but often ends up the primary reason why a project goes ahead is precisely because the leadership wants it to go ahead because they think it can generate revenues for their personal or political benefits. And that's really the game we're playing with here. So we shouldn't be under any illusion that such governments might, or individuals in charge might wish to be held accountable. They don't. So if we, if we approach this as a sort of technocratic me uh, method, it's not going to work. We have to empower citizens and we have to empower all the institutions to be able to hold such uh, leaders to account. And I, I think we have a classic example I, uh, perhaps it's a diversion into a sort of um, stratospherically hideous circumstances of what's going on in Ukraine right now, because that's obviously, you know, an, uh, an aggressive war and so on. But the complete lack of accountability and the bankrolling of what has turned out for all to see now as a violent kleptocracy, namely Russia at this time, is precisely because there is no accountability systems in place that really in the end are able to hold that government to account. And uh, I, I, I've thought a lot in the last few weeks, what is the difference between the role of leadership in the fossil fuel industry in particular in Russia today and its bankrolling of those behaviors and what we encountered in Angola? What is the difference? One was in Africa, one was 25 years ago. Uh, the company's position was simply, oh, well, we're just doing business. They weren't doing business. They were in an absolutely complicit, corrupt relationship with the leadership, and they aided and abetted 
a violent kleptocracy. And that's precisely what's going on right now. So I, I, if anything positive comes out of the situation now, I think we have to actually realize that we need to go beyond technocratic fixes. We have to empower citizens in processes like EITI, but other things too. And we have to really draw a close to the idea, I think, that it's okay to do business and empower violent kleptocracies, because in the worst cases, you get really bad outcomes. Perhaps I'll stop with that, because, uh, but I, I think it's very important that we get that right, because we are delusional, in my view, if we're going to address the climate crisis, if we cannot get at this nexus and work out how to empower citizens to understand the, the processes that are underway and to make decisions around whether or not to extract. And in many cases, many of the proposed projects going forward will end up stranded if we as a global society uh, do something about the climate crisis and reduce our demand, which we better hope we will. So we're in this sort of dice rolling moment right now where I think many projects are going ahead precisely because leaders think they're going to make the money and actually the citizens will end up in the debt. So EITI could play a very serious role, I think, in addressing that if we get this whole nexus of governance and get the data and the, the use of that data correct, but it can only do it as part of a wider set of practices. And those must include an ability of citizens to be empowered to say, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this? And to hold their leaders to account. We need to pull all that together. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Simon. Um, before I address the uh, questions that have been uh, sent in the Q&A, does any, uh, do any of the panelists want to respond specifically to anything that another panelist has, has said? Sai Saipiri, you've got your hand up. Uh, please go for it. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to respond to your question that you asked me. Um, and that actually also uh, sums up um, some comments that uh, other uh, panelists have said. So your question was whether we actually, we assume that whether EITI works best in more open society, right? Um, and, um, and whether actually it's normal that it doesn't work well in authoritarian regimes. Um, well, to be, to be honest with you, I haven't conducted the comparative case study between examining EITI implementation in between UK and Kyrgyzstan, but that would be an interesting way to look at it. Um, but what I can say uh, by conducting um, EITI research uh, in countries of um, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan and also looking at the situation in Azerbaijan, uh, what we can actually see is that um, uh, authoritarian regimes very often um, adopt the initiative, as has been said by the panelists, uh, for their own private interest. And very often the ITI process has actually been subverted um, uh, by the leaders. Um, and the initiative um, serves different interests, such as their reputational concerns, but also brings uh, the FDI, uh, the foreign direct investments in the country. Uh, and so on. Um, but what, what I can see from my research, particularly if I look at uh, the difference between uh, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan and also in Azerbaijan, is that uh, Kyrgyzstan being more open society, although uh, the civil society space there is shrinking as well, uh, what we can see that EITI actually uh, works slightly better uh, than in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan because we have um, a more or less uh, independent civil society um, in Kazakhstan. Um, and I think Maria is, is even better placed than me now because my research probably on Kazakhstan needs to be updated, but largely the EITI runs by the Gong organization that are actually uh, sponsored and funded by the state agency. Um, and they actually serve the interest of the state here. Um, and in uh, Azerbaijan, as we, we have seen, because there the space has completely disappeared for civil society, um, it was uh, the ATI was actually very uh, useless uh, for the for the government because uh, it was creating more noise and um, and, and more problems uh, than actually uh, improving its reputation. <laughs> so um, and I think uh, that demonstrates that yes, perhaps EATI works better in more open societies, uh, but this still needs to be uh, researched further, especially uh, compare uh, between the autocracies and democracies. Maria uh, is hand hands raised. Maria, go go for it. Just a quick remark to what Sepira said uh, about uh, Gonga in um, uh, ATI sector. In fact, no. Uh, we have some Gonga in ATI sector, but they are really not active and uh, 
a lot of independent uh, NGOs uh, works on ATI issues, raised uh, these issues in the MSG meetings, and uh, actually uh, Gonda doesn't uh, uh, build an obstacle for the real uh, uh, NGOs in uh, ATI implementation. Um, more problems with um, uh, governmental NGO we have in regions, on the regional level where, uh, for example, companies, uh, local government and local society trying to discuss some extractive issues. Thank you. Uh, Simon, do you want to come on, on on something or I've got a question for you from the audience? I was. I wanted to say something about um, 1.3 and its interpretation, but but uh, I think if you're talking about the question from the audience, you're talking about 1504. Um, That's right. Yeah. Do, do you want to take those together? Just or? do those quick. Yeah, yeah. They're sort of, I suppose, slightly related in the sense that there are two contemporary fights, for want of a better term, that are sort of ongoing. I think. Um, one. I mean, it sort of comes out of the Azerbaijan uh, <laughs> situation. We did have violent clampdowns at the time prior to the suspension. And those, those went on for quite some time and raised serious concerns <coughs> uh, across um, uh, the sort of network of organizations that were internationally working on uh, in this area. And uh, it took an extraordinarily long time before we got to the point where, where Azerbaijan was faced with having failed to meet expectations put to it by the board and then ended up being suspended. And then <clears throat> all the rest happened after that, which is quite unfortunate. Um, but since then, we've had another couple of examples. One involved um, Honduras, uh, and the other, uh, which is more recent, is the Philippines. And in both occasions, I won't go into detail on them, other than to say we had serious uh, threats and indeed uh, arbitrary killings of citizens on the ground in both countries, <clears throat> total impunity, lack of, uh, um, you know, um, uh, investigation and holding anyone to account for these things, other abuses that you can imagine, there's a spectrum of things before you get to the extreme end that I just mentioned, but pretty much the whole panoply of nasty stuff going on. The whole point of the so-called civil society protocol is it's supposed to empower citizens to hold the governments and companies to account around this nexus, this deal that that they strike together to extract resources that belong to the citizens of that country. It's not an unreasonable proposition. But it's very clear that our partners on the board, our fellow board members outside of the civil society uh, constituency, simply don't accept an interpretation, which is, uh, I think, the spirit of intent of the construction of the civil society protocol that allows such consequences to lead to the suspension of a country. And we're not talking about lots of countries where this would happen. Uh, there's absolute resistance to tie the consequence of the kinds of things I was describing with an outcome that could lead to suspension. Countries are given endless, um, uh, endless chances to improve, even when it's blatantly obvious that that's not going to happen. There's many other things I could say about that, but I just want to put that on the table because the, 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 the implementation of the ITI is only as good as the outcome that can be negotiated. That's essentially what we're doing. And when our fellow board colleagues are not willing to go there, we're kind of stuck. And we're stuck with this, in my view, utterly inadequate interpretation of part 1.3 of the standard, the civil society protocol, with respect to countries which go into the sort of autocratic violent kleptocracy space and clearly prevent citizens from working. The, the other sort of slightly related in the sense that it's sort of they flow together a little bit um, relates to uh, companies and their behavior. Um, the, the question uh, the, 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 that I asked about whether, whether I should respond to relates to um, efforts by uh, companies that currently sit on the EITI board to lobby to make sure that the, the world's first uh, law that required project level disclosure of payments, namely section 1504 of the Dodd-Frank Act, which was passed into law in June, July, I forget now, 2010. That's how long we've been waiting for this. Has still failed to uh, be put in a place where the rule that, op that essentially operates the law, so it's implemented, is currently completely inadequate. And there's lots of cuts and thrust to how we got to this situation, but these companies in particular have been absolutely full on 
uh, lobbying and undermining and seeking to prevent this from happening. And so bad did this get that last year, early last year, a complaint was filed by the uh, US part of the Publish What You Pay network. And it resulted in an extraordinary meeting of the board, which resulted in absolutely no sanction of the companies at all, which just shows you how it's all very well we all sit down and discuss. But when there's a veto, you know, a Security Council type permanent five veto process that happens, we end up with the companies essentially censoring the ability to hold them to account for even though they're sitting on the board directly undermining the initiative they sit they, they claim to be part of. And that's really part of, that's really the, the problem. I, I personally think that's a scandal of massive proportions. And not about EITI, it's a scandal of massive proportion about the companies involved. You know, part of me feels like saying, how dare you sit there and claim to be early originators of transparency and accountability when your every action is to undermine. It's completely consistent with those same companies' actions to mislead and distort and cover up uh, efforts to have a proper adult conversation around the climate crisis. They've prevented this for 40 years in some cases. Uh, it's exactly the same methodology. And it basically, in the end, you, you, you're left sitting, well, are they really interested in accountability? And my honest answer is no, I don't think they are. I think that their honest position is they want to have an opaque environment in which, you know, the, the historical narrative of particularly the fossil fuel sector around the world can continue. We have to ask why. I think we have to call them on it. And I, I think their position on the board behaving like that is frankly untenable. Uh, but nevertheless, they still sit there. And we have recently tightened up what are called the company expectations that define how, um, you know, the companies that claim to be supporting companies should behave. But, um, you know, there are several loopholes in that which have yet failed to be elucidated because the companies in that process refused to engage with them properly to the last minute, and then the process was ended. So actually, we could have a repetition of the same thing, and we obviously will have to wait and see what the consequences of that will be. I, I would say that could be quite a disaster if that was to happen. But this goes, you know, this goes back on the companies. You know, they, they claim to be pro-transparency and accountable, and they're not. Um, I'll stop with that. Thanks, Simon, and uh, thanks to, to to Barnaby from Global Witness for the question. Um, Oliana, I think you want to come in, not not necessarily on this point, but on on general points the panelists have raised. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, just want to to <laughs> to emphasise on um, with regards to what uh, Simon has been saying that it is important to know that TATI is a multi-stakeholder organisation, respecting companies governments, civil society equally. And uh, it is very important to know that the ATI always tries to reach a consensus and here is each side. Um, uh, when, when, you, when, you, when Simon talked about uh, companies, uh, another example, and, and the processes with uh, Azerbaijan and the uh, and, uh, Philippines, uh, you know, something else comes to my mind and I'm not speaking this in my capacity as the ATI office holder, but, uh, um, organizations like ATI value democratic values, right, um, and freedoms, and therefore treats all stakeholders equally. Um, however, um, as Western world is uh, treating uh, all, <laughs> uh, all other countries democratically as well, we see the United Nations Security Council still keeps Russia sitting there. Uh, and you think that uh, uh, all, uh, all participants share those values, but they do not, right? But they still treat them equally. Um, with regards to, I wanted to uh, comment on uh, Cyprus uh, uh, research. I think in the Kyrgyz Republic, I think also important to note that uh, um, um, Kyrgyz Republic has been implementing ATI for many years. So it's been up and down, ups and downs there and uh, certain flourishing periods for civil society, uh, followed by uh, decline in their activity. Um, in particular, I was witnessing um, a great uh, subnational campaign by, locals, by civil society, uh, creating public receptions in six extractive regions, informing them um, about, um, about the situation with extractive industries, helping them um, um, mitigate uh, license 
uh, risks and um, and their, and, and uh, helping them with their claims on pasture territories that were that uh, taken for the um, for the licenses. So that was back in 2012, 13, 14, 15. Uh, I recognize that right now perhaps the civil society is not that active in the Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, I must admit that uh, we as ATI International Secretariat also had difficulties um, working in the Kyrgyz Republic recently due to all the political changes and have just recently re-established um, our communication with dedicated people in the government. So we hope to revamp this, the process this year and see where it leads and help the government and the multi-stakeholder group together with civil society define new goals and objectives for the ATR implementation in the country. And lastly, uh, just to, uh, to reiterate a lot of uh, the comments related to uh, authoritarian regimes, um, I think it's, um, it's uh, unfortunately uh, raising tendency in Central Asia that they uh, uh, now lean towards Russia more than to the West, and the, the changes in the governments that we see right now, they uh, show uh, rise of authoritarian regimes. Um, so, um, of course, as this will develop, I am concerned about the future of the ATI. Thank you. Thanks, Aliana. Uh, if we turn now to Gubad, if you give your comments, but if I can also throw a question uh, your way, a uh, question from Michael Barron. Uh, is there any dialogue currently with international institutions such as the EBRD, Asian Development Bank and others regarding promoting transparency in Azerbaijan? So um, respond first to any of the panelists and then maybe if you can, you can deal with that one. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your, uh, for, for the question. And uh, just I want to make the comment about the company's participation in the EITI process, and then I am going to respond to the question regarding international financial institution. And I want to say that uh, when Azerbaijan was in EITI, we faced a lot of difficult uh, to cooperate the companies because the company's representatives uh, at the MSC was very low level. No one uh, decision makers uh, involved the member of the MSG on behalf of the companies. They uh, usually uh, attend uh, the public uh, PR managers and uh, who is only uh, as observer uh, participated the MSG meeting. Uh, and then Azerbaijan leave EITI, the companies were most happy because uh, no more EITI in Azerbaijan, including the BP and the uh, Equinor and uh, also the American companies uh, in Azerbaijan, uh, the mostly the Western companies operated. There is no company uh, from the East, uh, only Petronas Bus, and now they change, replace the Lukoi, and no one, uh, the Chinese company operated in Azerbaijan. As for the, uh, the international financial institution, I want to say that all of the uh, International Financial Institution has local office in Azerbaijan, ATB and the EBRD, World Bank, and others as well. We rely uh, on, the, on that they would stop allocation loans for the Southern Gas Corridor project or influence the government to create the uh, environment, create the enabling environment for the civil society activities. And uh, I attended uh, a lot of time the EBRD uh, General Assembly meeting. Uh, I attended the EBRD's President Town Hall meeting. I raised the question about the EITI station and the civil society uh, enabling environment in Azerbaijan. They listened to us uh, during the Town Hall meeting, during the, our personal meeting with the member of the executive directors. Uh, but uh, they never uh, affect the government decision. And unfortunately, still uh, we have the problem with the corporate of the international financial institution. And international financial institution invited us uh, for the dialogue when they prepare the strategy memorandum, country strategy memorandum. In that time, uh, come to mind 
and invite us uh, as a representative of the civil society for the dialogue. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the role of the international financial institutions, especially EBRD and the World Bank, uh, is very low. ADB uh, out of this process. Uh, ADB never uh, cooperated with the civil society organization. Uh, but as I said, EBRD and the World Bank invited us to attend the General Assembly meeting to raise some question, but they never uh, affect uh, the government decision uh, related to the civil society enabling environment in Azerbaijan. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Gubert. Um, I'm going to turn to Saipira now because she's got her hand up, and then I'm going to give a question to Maria from the uh, Q and A. Uh, but first, Saipira. Yeah, uh, I just want to quickly respond to what Olena said about the public reception desk. Um, it is true that um, when I was actually also in 2015, uh, Kyrgyzstan has implemented the public reception desk, which was a great initiative uh, specifically for mitigating mining conflict uh, in Kyrgyzstan and creating a community dialogue, actually. Um, however, the problem is that uh, these public reception desks, uh, from my research, what I found, they were very often run by two or three people. And uh, there were also lack of funding, actually, uh, to ensure their sustainability in the long term. And um, what has also been mentioned also by um, Maria is that the problem with the EIT initiative um, in uh, countries uh, like Central Asia is uh, the visibility within the government. So, and this is the reason why the, or the organization, the initiative actually fluctuates in that in some years we have a peak uh, where uh, you can actually see many progress that have been achieved and, and also dialogue. And at some point, the government just lost interest. Uh, in the case of Kyrgyzstan, um, we also have the reshuffling of the parliament. We had uh, seen um, two, revolu two revolution and the third one, we still don't know to, whether it's to call it revolution or not. And so the idea uh, very often actually uh, is losing um, touch within the government and someone needs to dig in again the initiative and to recall the government that we still have this great initiative that we need to work on. And um, in, um, uh, and in in, in Kyrgyzstan, um, the difficulty of the EITI, although it has actually, uh, it, it can really work if there is actually the commitment and the willingness of the government to actually sustain the initiative. Because one of the issues of Kyrgyzstan, from my research and what I observed, was about the financial supporting. And, um, and this is actually different from Kazakhstan because the Kazakh government actually <laughs> invests in, uh, financially uh, in the initiative. Well, in Kyrgyzstan, um, very often uh, the EITA uh, uh, has been actually uh, dependent on external donor funds. Um, and, and so uh, the problem lies in the sustainability of the EITI as opera uh, operation, basically, and to how much actually government cares about it. Thanks, Lipira. Um Turning to uh, Maria now, a question from Karina Litvak. Thanks, Karina, for joining us. Um, superb presentation, Kazakhstan. Uh, can you think of <clears throat> excuse me? Can you think of any voluntary actions that industry could take to help counter the problems you've described? Uh, thank you for this question. And uh, I think any voluntary actions from companies will be very uh, welcome in Kazakhstan because uh, at the MSG level we have uh, associations of companies, uh, for example. Uh, Kaz Energy Association, which is led by Timur Kulibayev, who is the son-in-law of first president of Kazakhstan. So, in fact, at the MSG level, we, we usually uh, don't get any support from uh, companies in the issue of, um, of the better transparency. So I think the industry could uh, participate, the industry representatives could participate at MSG meetings, for example, as observers. Uh, uh, we as NGO often participate in these meetings as observers and we, of, uh, we always have uh, a, a floor if we want it and um, companies could do the same. Also, we really need uh, help of uh, uh, companies uh, at the working group levels because, in fact, there, there are only uh, Ministry of Industry and uh, NGO uh, part uh, participate. 
And uh, another help that we could uh, get from industry, I think if industry representatives could initiate discussion on contract transpa transparency. Because for example, uh, uh, I think it was two years ago, we sent a, a request uh, letters to the ministries and to the companies about uh, fiscal regime on uh, Kashagan and Karachiganak, we get the answers from the ministries that they cannot disclose this information without companies approval. And we got the answer from the NCOC and uh, TPO, it is a consortium that uh, operates these two oil fields, that they cannot disclose this information without ministry approval. So if companies will initiate this discussion on contract transparency, I think it would, would be great for Kazakhstan. And of course, any discussion on a better transparency and uh, civil society participation, it would be great too. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, I'm going to take the two questions, remaining questions on the Q&A now from Trevor Clark. <clears throat> he says, how is the dark web affecting data collection and clamping down on corruption? And also says, mining for minerals can affect water courses. How is the effect mitigated in this case? I guess none of us are really experts on the dark web, but it, I think it was telling that, uh, uh, Maria, you mentioned, you know, the, the, the Paradise Papers and, and that kind of a data leak. Uh, I know there was also the Kaza word uh, uh, email leak in, in Kazakhstan that can actually have more effect on 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 discussion of of, of, of corruption in, in a particular country than um, the EITI reporting because that's actually getting to sometimes the heart of the matter, which, as you identified, Maria, was um, you know the, the beneficial ownership of a lot of these uh, companies by the you know, members of the the, the the ruling elite of of, of Kazakhstan or or, or, or wherever. Uh, regarding the, the 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 water courses, this maybe can open it out a little bit. Um, I, I guess it, it's maybe fair to say that as enthusiasm for, for 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 fossil fuels wanes, perhaps enthusiasm for EITI wanes as as as, as well. Is there a way of, of of perhaps incorporating other elements into the EITI process? I mean, the the, the question there raises water courses, but of course we have. Uh, you know, climate change is the is the big issue, and I should note that um, Sean Bradley from Chatham House has written a, a paper on this about how perhaps in the future EITI can start to look at, at things like um, <clears throat> carbon emissions and other things related to climate change in order to revivify interest uh, in, in 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 EITI. Um, Simon, you've got your your hand up. Do you want to say anything on this? I was just going to say we've we've got the beginnings of environmental disclosures to the issue of water courses, but uh, I, I think in my view that's insufficiently developed, and um, you know it's a work in progress. And in lots of places, we you know we, we we still have to see progress in what countries might produce. And of course, none of that's useful unless you've got that accountability. Um, sort of process that I was trying to describe a bit earlier, which is not just about EITI. EITI is a bit part of it. It, it needs other things like good enforcement in country of rules and appropriate rules in the first place uh, uh, as well. So to the water courses, I think that's the best I can say at the moment. This is a work in progress. And, and of course, it requires the other participants on the board um, to the point Oleana was making about, you know, we're, we, you know, we're, we're a multi-stakeholder group and we can only go as far as the lowest common denominator. That's been, I suppose, my frustration being there all the way through its history is how long it takes to make progress. And when the lowest common denominator won't move, it really is a glacial pace that we go at. Anyway, in that context, um, I think a very worrying side of what comes next is the extent to which we can make re really meaningful progress to us uh, in the ITI term uh, around coming up with changes to the standard that will deliver something useful in the sort of collective fight we have to address the climate crisis. And I think uh, carbon emissions obviously is, could, could be one thing, but, but I think almost the most important thing we could do, which goes back around, around data, is to get at the viability or not of projects. And to some extent, that's a sort of projection exercise. It's not a futurology thing. It's basically trying to look at 
different scenarios, which companies already do when they make their final investment decision about whether to go ahead. They already have assumptions about oil price or whatever. And these kind of things are artificially influenced by the conflict going on right now. We've seen all the prices going up. But if we were to assume that we're in a world which will meet a one and a half degree um, temperature limit, the down curve, as I was mentioning earlier, for consumption globally is massive. There is no space at all for any new projects. We have to even wind down many of the existing projects. That's the reality. This is not a political statement. This is the, this is the consequence of the physics and biochemistry of our planet and its weather system. We, we either meet that target and succeed in holding to one and a half degrees, or we don't, and we won't. And if we don't, then we could kick in feedback mechanisms, which will make the system go even further. And that's, I think, really problematic, because that becomes then the existential crisis everyone is concerned about. So in my view, we just basically have to, if we're concerned about future development on a planetary scale, we have to meet that target. And that means that many projects that exist already have to be shut down. And there is no space in terms of a carbon budget for new ones. So whose projects are going to get shut down? And how does that process work? And who decides whether some go first faster than others? And the answer to that is nobody has any idea at all right now. There's no credible information. So could we, as a disclosure mechanism, actually get to a place where we can put the right kind of data up, where people can be empowered to make the right decisions. And I would say through an equity lens, it has to be countries that are the richest that go first. So how do we do that? Right now, all the rich countries think they have to increase their production. How does that work? Uh, and the answer is we don't have any answers. So, you know, EITI is the only place I can see right now that could, if it got its act together, get that right. And you mentioned, um, uh, just the last thing I'll say and I'll shut up, the, the, the waning interest, but, but that presupposes the ITI is all about oil and gas. What we're also seeing around the world is a massive expansion in mining to meet the demand of raw materials for an alternative energy future. That's going on all over the place. So the issues of governance around the extractive sector do not disappear with the disappearance, hopefully soon, of the fossil fuel sector. Thanks, Simon. Saipera, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I just wanted to comment on Panama Papers um, and corruption leaks. Um, so uh, I think uh, the population in Central Asia is, uh, is not dumb. They're actually very well aware about the corruption of the, at the elite level. And this has been well demonstrated um, uh, with the latest protests in Kazakhstan, um, where there is actually a fatigue of, of, from the population um, with uh, corruption. Um, and uh, the population actually is still living in uh, poverty, um, although Kazakhstan is one of the richest uh, energy producing country in the, in the world. Um, but the problem is that um, we need to have a platform for the population to hold its government accountable. Uh, and uh, this uh, platform, unfortunately, uh, does not exist uh, in uh, authoritarian countries. Um, and uh, the, the case of Kazakhstan demonstrates very well when population actually started to raise the issue of corruption, what happened is that the government has responded with repression um, and, and violence. Um, and what's also important to know, because uh, there's a large uh, size of the population living in poverty, um, what uh, the, the, the local residents, uh, their main concern is the surviving actually, is how to, go, it's how to live everyday life. And, and that's why, although they hear uh, the leaks of corruption, they don't have much power to actually challenge it. Um, and there's actually also lack of independent media. Um, and so the stories don't often actually reach even uh, rural villages. Um, so that's what I want to say about the uh, Pan Panama Papers um, and the corruption cases. Um, on the other side, um, and also um, actually to this, uh, to, to uh, a final point, um, when uh, stories like Panama, Panama Papers are leaked out and when we actually uh, corruption exposed, what very often happens that the government responds with a reshuffling <laughs> of the government bodies. Um, and, and so uh, the story is very uh, quickly disappears actually from the, from the local medias. Um, and uh, to respond to the um, environment, 
I think here EITI has started actually to do some work uh, to, um, to actually uh, link uh, the impact of the mining industries on the environment because um, what we've seen uh, more and more is that um, environment is becoming one of the main concerns for social conflicts in the mining sector. And, and I think here the EITI has actually the real potential actually uh, to deliver something tangible and concrete and, uh, and to work actually with uh, mining companies uh, and government. But here again, although um, many uh, countries uh, do have uh, env environmental regulations, uh, their, um, um, their implementation remains weak because uh, the state is understaffed and lacks of expertise actually to implement uh, these rules. Uh, and, and so this is the whole question related to the capacity. Another problem is also related to the willingness of, um, of companies, uh, particularly, for example, in Central Asia, where China is extremely active to actually cut uh, the negative effect of the environment. Um, because um, let's be honest, uh, mining companies that are interested um, about their uh, mining profits, and they don't always very much care about the, uh, the, the impact uh, on the environment and local livelihood produced by mining. Uh, but this conversation, uh, I think, is already uh, has started uh, because we've seen a wave of local conflicts and particularly in the case of Kyrgyzstan. Thanks, Zypira. Um, we're almost out of time. I, I reckon we could maybe push it by three or four minutes past half, half past if, if, if the speakers uh, can, but don't want to go any longer than that because I know we're all incredibly busy. Uh, one final question on the Q&A and then uh, maybe we'll wrap up with some final comments if anybody has them. Uh, Timirlan Mahmietov, uh, a question for Maria. Uh, I have a question about how the January events in Kazakhstan influenced the cooperation with EITI and transparency in the extractive uh, industry. Uh, Maria, has the events in January changed anything? Uh, please go ahead. Uh, I think for the moment there is no changes, uh, in fact. Uh, maybe more civil society organization and more journalists uh, be became more interested in the uh, extractive sector, extractive sector issues, uh, but uh, from the government, we, in fact, we don't see any uh, enthusiasm in re re implementing the ATI, unfortunately. Great, thanks. Um, Aliana, you've got your hand up. Um, maybe I can give the final word to you and throw in a question as well related to what we've just been talking about. Um, when we're talking about perhaps expanding EITI to look at climate change, you do have this pushback from certain companies and governments saying, you know, this is mission creep and, and uh, you know, this, it shouldn't happen. But at the same time, perhaps for EITI to stay relevant, it's, it's what needs to, 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 to happen. Um, just wondered on your thoughts on the future of EITI and of course, anything else you, you'd, you'd like to say in response to, 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 to anything. <laughs> Sure. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, with regards to ATI in Kazakhstan, that uh, we continue working with the government after the January changes and, and events. Um, the, currently, the National Secretariat is preparing the ATI report. Um, and uh, at ATI, we have a, um, uh, um, a process where we assess the implementation of the ATI requirements called validation. And the next validation for Kazakhstan will be January 2023. This will be crucial with regards to addressing previous corrective actions and uh, and pulling its act together for the government and other constituencies. We do have concerns with regards to transparency of state-owned enterprises and their transactions, as well as contract transparency, beneficial ownership, um, and some other requirements. Uh, with regards to the future of EATI, um, I actually had it on the slides but didn't have time to talk about, but uh, the ITI indeed looks into the current shifts in the energy policy across the world and uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll be supporting the work related to energy transition where, uh, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, the ATI will be reviewing its 2019 standard. It will be 2023 standard launched uh, hopefully in June next year. And this year is time to uh, for all stakeholders and interested people to provide your views and comments with regards to possible changes to the ATI standard. Um, of course, through uh, the most of work will be done by the ATI board. So people like Marila Bachova and Simon Tyler would be people to go to with regards to communicating their 
their views and, and, and uh, with regards to um, communicating their views on, on the ATI standard changes and, and potential uh, new requirements. Um, so I, I know that uh, all, com all extractive companies um, uh, are thinking for other uh, uh, ways of uh, providing energy and uh, um, the current policy of the EU, the green policy, and uh, also statements from the US with regards to transitioning from uh, using uh, fossil fuels. It, of course, will, uh, um, uh, will contribute to the transformation of the ATI from focusing on extractive industries uh, towards looking uh, more at renewable energy and other energy sources. Fantastic. Thanks, Oliana. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thanks uh, so much to uh, Oliana, yeah. Gubad, Saipeda, Maria and Simon for joining us. Um, please, uh, thanks. thank you to the audience for your questions. Uh, uh, please continue to attend uh, Chatham House events. And if you're in London, uh, please join us in person because we're just uh, in the process of opening things up again. So be, if you are in London, uh, please come to an event. Um, thanks again to our panelists and uh, take care everyone, see you soon, bye now. <laughs>